This webcast is presented by the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, or ARC's CAPS User Network. Uh, before we begin, just a few housekeeping details. If you're having difficulty hearing the audio from your computer speakers, you can change your audio settings so that WebEx and connect through your phone instead. In the event that your computer freezes up during the presentation, we recommend that you try logging out and logging back in again to the webcast to refresh the page. It's also possible, however, that you may be experiencing a lag in the advancement of slides due to your internet connection speed. If you need help at any time during this webcast, please use the Q&A icon. We have a team standing by to help you. Uh, at any point uh, through today's presentation, if you have uh, technical difficulties, again, use the Q&A feature um, and wanted to let you know that today's session is being recorded and a replay of the webcast, as well as the slides, will be made available on the ARC website. If you have colleagues who weren't available to join us today, you can make sure to let them know that they don't have to miss out on the event. Over the course of the next hour, we hope to give you an overview of the CAPS program, tell you about CAPS surveys and their purpose, explain how CAPS surveys are developed and how they can be administered, describe how CAPS survey results can be used to improve patient experience, and more, most importantly, answer your questions. We have a fantastic lineup of speakers for you today. To open our session, you will hear from Karen Ginsberg from the Center uh, for Quality Improvement and Patient Safety at ARC, she directs the CAPS program, as well as the surveys, surveys of patient safety culture. A little later in the hour, you will also hear, hear from Dale Schaller, principal of Schaller Consulting Group and a longstanding member of the CAPS consortium. And I'm Stephanie Fry, a senior study director at Westat and advocate for the importance of collecting patient experience data and reporting those data. Welcome, really happy to have you with us here today. Uh, so, without further delay, I'm going to pass it over to my colleague, Karen Ginsberg, to get us started. Karen, over to you. Thanks, Stephanie. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. This is our annual CAPS 101, as we call it, an introduction to the CAPS program and a little bit about the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality that sponsors the, uh, the CAPS work. Uh, and welcome to new users and also welcome to those who might have had experiences with us before. You'll be hearing some new information today as well. So, uh, Stephanie, can I have the uh, first slide, please? The next slide. So, um, I want to tell you a little bit about the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality. It's, we're a research and development agency in the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, and we're, we're a science-based agency. And we talk about our core competencies, and as a science-based agency, we invest in health systems research and evidence to make health uh, healthcare safer and improve quality. We create tools for healthcare professionals to use to improve care for their patients. And we generate measures and data that you can use to track the uh, progress of the US healthcare system, improve performance and measure that. And, and we also feel as part of our mission at ARC to um, get our science out to implementation, get our tools and products out to you, uh, our users. Next slide, please. A little bit about the CAPS program, Consumer Assessment of Healthcare Providers and Systems is what CAPS stands for. And this is a program to advance the understanding and measurement and improvement of patients' experiences with their healthcare. We have continuously funded this program. We're now in our 27th year. And uh, we, uh, are, we have a group that's responsible for the technical quality of the program. We call it the CAPS Consortium, consisting of staff from ARC, our, our grantees, Yale University School of Public Health and the Rand Corporation, and our contractor, Westat. And I wanna point out, we get questions about this a lot. Um, as a science-based agency, as a research and development agency, we don't have the authority to mandate the use of CAP surveys. So if we, we are responsible for science and, and the, the uh, science behind the CAP surveys. So if you're participating in a program at, which is required for your program participation, if you, you're asked to administer a CAP survey, that's coming from another organization who's using our materials. But again, ARC doesn't have the authority to um, require CAP survey administration. Um, on the next slide, please. A little bit about the surveys themselves. 
They are the gold standard for patient experience measurement, and that's because we capture the patient's voice in all stages of the development process, the survey development process. The surveys measure patient experience of care in different healthcare settings, with plans, with providers. Uh, they're developed using a standardized methodology and research findings. And CAPS is, is trademarked, is, is a trademark of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. It's operated by ARC. And, and when you see the CAPS trademark, that, meant, that means that the surveys were developed according to CAPS design principles and, and uh, met the standards to use this trademark. It means they're valid and reliable surveys. So on the next slide, uh, I just want to point out that we have an active research agenda that focuses on understanding patient experience, how to measure it, on uh, best methods to implement surveys. And that's in addition to the work that we're known for, which is developing those surveys. Uh, so uh, just a point about the, the um, research on implementing surveys and administering them. We uh, hadn't made this an end product to users in the past, in the past couple of years, so we've changed that position and we're trying to make our research on um, survey administration more visible to you. On the next slide, I just wanted to run down a few um, research topics here at ARC on patient experience. So we're focusing on things like shared decision-making and patient engagement, uh, collecting data using narrative protocols, uh, the effectiveness, as I said, of different survey administration modes for CAPS data, collecting it, uh, measuring patient experience with telehealth, and uh, assessing racial and ethnic disparities in patient experience. So on my last slide, I just wanna point out a couple of things that are new, and some of this you're gonna hear about later. Actually, the first item is not that new, but it really bears repeating. We've updated our CAPS Clinician in Group 3.0 and our Health Plan 5.0, that you'll notice there's a version that's now .1 for 3.1 and 5.1 for uh, those surveys. And that means they have a slight wording change in them that allows uh, to accommodate telehealth visits. So it's the same six month look back period for Clinician in Group 3.1 and, and five, Health Plan 5.1 that you're used to seeing. They just a, a slight wording change. But then we developed CAPS uh, Clinician Group 4.0, uh, which is uh, focused on the most recent visit, and it asks questions about telehealth, and it, it's, it reflects a more heavily telehealth environment. Um, so there's some additional questions on telehealth there, and it's visit-based. We're creating a database for a survey, uh, our child HCAP survey, uh, which is a survey that's not required by anybody, uh, by any organization. Participation will be voluntary in this database, and, and you'll hear more from us in the upcoming months about that new database. Uh, we have, ARC has a new um, data portal you'll hear about today, uh, data tools, HTTPS, HTTP colon slash slash datatools.arc.gov slash CAPS. It's a portal. That's the CAPS page. It's a portal for all of ARC's data tools, so we're happy to, to show that to you. It replaces our old online um, reporting system. And then we have, uh, we'll talk to you about a tool that we have called Your Caps Survey, HTTPS uh, colon slash slash yourcaps.ran.org, and that will help you create a customized cap survey with supplemental items. So thanks again for joining us. And with that, I'm going to turn this back to Stephanie. The floor is yours, Stephanie. Thanks, Karen. Really appreciate the background and orientation. Um, I want to spend the next few minutes telling you about patient experience and how it's measured through CAPS surveys. ARC's definition of patient experience addresses various healthcare settings and contexts, as well as examples of the aspects of healthcare that have been found to be important to patients based on years of focus group and consumer testing. Patient experience encompasses the range of interactions that patients have with, health, with the healthcare system, including care from health plans and from doctors and nurses and staff in hospitals, physician practices, and other healthcare facilities. As an integral component of healthcare quality, patient experience includes several aspects of healthcare delivery that patients value highly when they seek and receive care, such as getting timely appointments, easy access to information, and good communication with care providers. So why is it important to measure patient experience? Um, well, 
uh, there are several reasons, as you see here. Um, extensive evidence demonstrates that there is a very strong relationship between patient experience and other important out outcomes. Um, honestly, that could be a whole webinar of its own, um, but at a very high level, positive patient experience is associated with positive health outcomes, includes, including patient adherence, process measures, clinical outcome measures, and patient safety. There's also a business case for delivering patient-centered care. Better patient-reported outcomes uh, have been shown to be correlated with lower medical malpractice risks, higher employee satisfaction, and these can be tied to payment in various ways. Uh, the CAPS surveys are built on a set of principles that weave through uh, the development of all CAPS surveys. Um, so for starters, CAPS surveys focus on what patients think is important about healthcare delivery. It's what they want to know as consumers of healthcare. To ensure that CAPS surveys reflect the patient focus, there's a standardized development process that includes connecting focus groups with patients, drafting survey domains and questions, cognitively testing those drafts with patients, and ensuring that patients and consumers are involved in the development at every step. Stakeholder and user Im input is also incorporated at the initial development step, but also on an ongoing basis. As the CAPS consortium revises surveys as needed, for example, where Karen just mentioned the transition to the 3.1 and 4.1 versions of surveys. Um, CAPS consortium conducts ongoing research into best practices to support all aspects of sampling, survey methodology, data collection, analysis, and reporting, knowing that these things aren't stagnant, they change over time. Prior to releasing any survey, there's extensive testing. Testing is often conducted iteratively with multiple rounds to ensure that changes implemented are achieving the intended effect. Field test results are analyzed to assess the representativeness and reliability of data. Documentation is available to support CAPS surveys and highlights the importance of the standardization that comes with CAPS. Collecting, analyzing, and reporting data in a standardized way allows for data to be compared over time. For example, to see how your scores have changed and what's different since perhaps you measured two years ago, and allows for comparison across entities, for example, across practices, plans, regions, or, or some other measure. Uh, finally, we've mentioned it before, but it bears repeating, um, all CAPS surveys, tools, and resources are in the public domain, so they are available on ARC's CAP web, CAPS website and available free of charge to all users. Um, the CAPS surveys uh, include a whole range of, of surveys, and we call them the core surveys. And so, as you'll see here, some surveys ask about patient experiences with providers, such as medical groups, practice sites, and surgical centers. These are shown in your upper left quadrant. Other surveys ask about patient experiences with care delivered in facilities, including hospitals, dialysis centers, and nursing homes. There's also CAPS surveys that ask enrollees about their experiences with health plans and related programs. And finally, CAPS includes a series of surveys that ask about patient experiences with care for a specific health condition, for example, uh, cancer care and mental or behavioral health care. All of these surveys and related documentation are again available on the ARC CAPS website. Given the focus on the aspects of care that are important to patients, uh, many CAPS surveys include questions related to similar topic areas, for example, communication. Within each survey, the measures are tailored to fit the specific facility or type of interaction and the type of care being delivered. Um, by, way of by way of sharing just a few common example, we have the domains here that are included in the clinician and group survey as well as the domains that are included in the hospital survey or the HCAP survey. So you'll see that there is some tailoring to those specific types of interactions within healthcare, but you'll see there's also some commonality, again, going back to the example of communication, which is important to patients, almost regardless of setting or type of care being delivered. CAP surveys allow for a fair bit of standardization um, in terms of the core survey and also allows users to supplement those core surveys or the standardized portion with elements that help them to meet their individual user needs. 
So for example, you can take the CAPS core or standardized portion of the survey and add in additional questions to meet your informational needs. Uh, so those could be either drawn from a CAPS set of supplemental items. So those are items that are made available to CAPS users and have been tested. Uh, and we have placement instructions in terms of where to put them and how to use them. Um, and then you can also have your own, what we refer to as homegrown items. And so you have your core standardized survey plus your unique individual survey items. And together that makes your CAPS survey, which is both standardized and customized to your needs. So you can do a little bit of both. Some examples of the supplemental items that make up the CAPS supplemental items are shown here. So some of the key aspects of healthcare that we know are important to consumers and may be a particular focus if you have a quality improvement initiative or something that you're really trying to dig in a little deeper to learn about. For example, shared decision-making, health literacy, perhaps you're looking at use of interpreter services within your care delivery system. Um, there's also narrative items, which allow for a collection of an open-ended series of feedback from patients. And then, as I mentioned before, the homegrown items um, that, that the CAPS uh, consortium also tells you how to insert those and where those should go within the survey. Um, and instructions on how to implement all of these additions are available, again, uh, with the guidance that's provided with CAPS surveys. Um, Karen mentioned as we started out that there is also a new tool available to help users, um, and it's the uh, Your Caps tool. And what it does is it allows you to pick your core survey, so the clinician and group, health plan, in center hemodialysis, or cancer care surveys are the ones that are represented currently. You can then select the supplemental items that you wish to insert within the survey, and it produces for you a PDF that renumbers the survey puts them all in the correct order in terms of where they should be placed and delivers you a template that you can use to design your survey to ensure that you have them all uh, set up and positioned the way they ought to be. So if you are interested in this additional support, you can visit https colon slash slash yourcaps.rand.org. I'm going to pivot for uh, just another couple of moments here and talk about how CAPS surveys are administered. And uh, it bears repeating what Karen mentioned earlier that ARC doesn't require the administration of CAPS surveys and so therefore provides rather a series of guidance documents to help you identify the best practices that would apply to you. So um, at the very first step, after you've identified your research goals and you've built your survey, uh, you need to draw a sample. The CAPS consortium conducts extensive testing to support users in deciding how many surveys they will need to field to answer their research questions. We conduct testing to assess level of reliability and validity of CAPS items um, based on the number of completed surveys. Sampling is a very good way to get a representative proportion of your population without providing a survey to every member of your practice or your group or your patient population. Um, but the, the specifics of how to do that sampling vary uh, by your intended goal, your data collection approach, and how you want to report the data. So when thinking about how big a sample size do you need for your purposes, it can be helpful to work backwards from your ultimate reporting goal. For example, um, if you were fielding the clinician and group survey, uh, your goal could be public reporting of scores for an ambulatory practice, or it could be quality improvement for a medical group, uh, for other surveys, there are also decisions to make about the level of reporting you're planning to do. Um, the next th thing to think about is how are you going to collect the data? This is important because your data collection methodology will impact the number of people who are likely to respond or your response rate. For example, if you mail a single survey to your sample, you may get you know, something in the neighborhood of 15% of people who return them, again, depending on your population. Um, whereas if you mailed a reminder and another non-response survey to people who didn't provide a response right off the bat, um, and then you called people who still didn't return their survey, you may get a 35 or 40% response rate. 
And again, uh, those response rates are just examples and they vary widely by population and, and many different things. Um, but uh, you can use your own historical data to see what you think um, your response rate may be or from response rates from other similar organizations. But uh, going back to your ultimate goal, if you think you need 300 completed surveys for your data use and reporting, you would need to use a methodology uh, to figure out your response rate, let's say 40%, and then calculate that you would need to have a starting sample of somewhere in the neighborhood of 750 patients. So after you figure out and complete your sampling, the next step is to assess what's the best, what's the best methodology for fielding your CAPS survey. There are many different ways to deliver and announce a survey to respondents. Um, common modes for administering CAPS surveys include mail, telephone, electronic or web-based, and mixed mode, including two or more of those approaches. ARC and the CAPS team have devoted considerable uh, effort into research on this issue and tested the modes that you see on this screen, as well as many other, including in-office administration, using uh, interactive voice response, using text messaging. Results from recent testing show that in a lot of circumstances, mail, uh, telephone, and mixed mode are good solutions to achieve a representative and reasonably high response rate. Um, importantly, it should be noted that when a web or electronic data collection has been tested alone without any other sort of uh, follow up with a different mode, uh, it consistently produces fairly low response rates and often not representative of an entire population. Choosing an, an appropriate survey methodology um, is tricky. It has cost impacts, um, it has response rate impacts, and it's highly nuanced. Um, things have been changing dramatically, particularly uh, since COVID. There has been kind of rapid evolution of how people use technology, what types of triggers will get people to respond, and uh, ARC and the CAPS team continue to evolve in the testing and reporting uh, of, of strategies that we've seen to be effective. And so that is something that uh, I think there will never be one right answer to what is the right data collection approach, um, but rather, you know, here are some strategies that have been shown to work for different population types. And finally, um, after you have built your survey, drawn your sample, fielded your uh, data collection instrument, you then move on to analysis of the data. And the goal of analysis is really to prepare for reporting. Uh, all CAPS surveys include composite measures, which are a group of questions that together assess patient experience with a particular area. Again, uh, for example, communication um, or access to care. Through analysis, you combine data for a series of questions and you, and you calculate a composite score uh, typically, individual survey items are less reliable than multiple item combinations for your reporting. If you're looking to compare your results to the results of others, during the analytic phase, it's also important to conduct case mix adjustment. Case mix adjusts for characteristics about survey respondents like age, education, health status, and conducting case mix adjustment makes it more likely that the differences that you see in the reported outcome are the results of actual differences in patient experiences versus differences in the types of patients seeking care in particular facilities or for particular providers. A case mix adjustment is really a way to level the playing field when doing those comparisons. To help with analysis, the CAPS team makes available a SAS macro to support composite measure calculation and also to do the case mix adjustment. The SAS macro, along with all of the other uh, support documentation is again available on the CAPS website. So with that, I will turn it over to my colleague Dale to speak a little bit about what do you do once you have your analyzed data? Yep, and thanks, Stephanie. Um, so this next and last segment of our webcast today is gonna focus on various uses of the CAPS survey results that Stephanie has just described to you, uh, how they come about. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna highlight just four major uses of CAP surveys and no doubt 
almost all of these are familiar to you. The first is public reporting of CAPS measures to uh, patients and consumers uh, for their use in decision making, also to provide incentives to health plans and providers for making improvements through transparency and accountability. Um, a good example of this is the CMS Compare site, which now provides a one-stop shopping place for looking at um, CAPS uh, survey scores for different settings of care, hospitals, dialysis centers, health plans, and medical practices. And a number of other collaboratives and agencies around the country certainly also do public reports that involve um, combining CAPS uh, survey results with other measures of performance. A second major use is the, the use of CAP surveys in value-based purchasing, which is about creating financial incentives to organizations that drive and, and reward the work they do to improve patient experience. And again, there's a, a, I think a very good example of this through the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services that use HCAPs, for example, in their hospital quality payment program. Um, the CAPS survey for accountable care organizations is another example for ACOs that participate in the Medicare shared savings program. And many private insurers and other organizations use similar programs and incentives to reward improvements in the providers and organizations that they, they contract with. A third use is for recognition and certification and a Good example of this is the use of the CAPS Health Plan Survey uh, for health plan accreditation by NCQA, the National Committee for Quality Assurance, and URAC. And the Joint Commission uses the HCAPS survey also for hospital accreditation. Last but not least is the use of CAPS surveys for basic research, uh, which is the foundation for improving CAPS surveys and, and finding uh, evidence based ways of actually improving the patient experience. Next slide. So all of these uses really are targeted to improving the quality of care, specifically improving patient experience. They're all ways of rewarding or supporting this activity, which is really what the CAPS program is all about. It's the fundamental end goal, I think, that we're all interested in achieving. So let's talk a little bit about improving patient experience. Next slide. This is um, an area that many of you on registration expressed a lot of interest in learning about. So we're going to focus a bit about this. And I guess the bottom line is to say uh, it's not easy, but it is definitely possible. And we have a lot of evidence and examples and strategies and tools to help organizations make improvements in patient experience. But I want to start by sort of going back to a fundamental observation that was made by a group of uh, CAPS researchers almost two decades ago in their evaluation of a quality improvement collaborative with uh, about eight medical groups in Minnesota. This is back in 2003 and 04. And what they found was that it is definitely possible to make small improvements in patient experience over a short period of time for specific projects. But if you're interested in sustaining substantial change over time, it really requires fundamental organizational changes, you need to engage your leadership, cultural change, establish periodic uh, measurement and, and, and feedback of performance measures, and gain experience in interpreting and using survey data. And, and this fundamental observation is borne out over and over again in research of, of uh, case studies of high-performing organizations. And this research has also led, next slide, to identifying about a half a dozen key factors that are important to organizations in achieving and, and maintaining uh, high levels of patient-centered care over time. Each one of these could be a webcast in and of itself. I'm just gonna briefly sort of describe each one and um, leave you with, with a couple of citations here on the screen. So the first, maybe most important, is the idea of, of achieving commitment uh, at the highest levels of leadership uh, in the organization, the CEO level or the board level to, to find and, and maintain a strategic vision that embraces the importance of patient experience and patient centeredness. Secondly, is, is having true partnerships with, with patients and families at multiple levels, including policy and planning, 
involving patients and families in the co-design of improvement and redesign efforts in the organization, and certainly at the level of care delivery, the actual interaction between patients and their clinicians. Thirdly, is a strong focus on the workforce. Um, that we're talking about embracing the importance of recruiting and training, recognizing and rewarding employees, because we recognize that employee positive experience really correlates directly with a positive experience with the patients that they serve. A fourth area, and this is where CAPS comes in, is the systematic measurement and feedback of performance. And this is using quantitative measures like CAPS surveys, but also in combination with qualitative measures that paint a picture of performance that you can assess um, periodically over time. And the last couple of factors I'll mention is having the supportive technology in organization and the infrastructure such as data portals or tools for um, decision making by patients and clinicians, and also a built environment um, that focuses not on amenities, not pianos in the lobby, but things that are fundamental to creating um, a healing environment, such as uh, noise reduction, appropriate uh, lighting and, and um, ambiance, and also wayfinding that all contribute to a positive environment for improving patient centered care. Next slide. So this is a cycle which is uh, common in quality improvement. It's often labeled a PDSA or plan, do, study, act cycle of continuous quality improvement. And this is when you wanna focus on a specific area, be it access to care or improving provider communication or courteousness of office staff or customer service. So the way to go about this is to use basically your CAPS data to begin monitoring your performance. And you can do that by comparing your results to peers or to benchmarks, identifying trends, drilling down to specific items within the CAPS survey that appear to suggest strengths or areas that you can and then recognizing that CAPS data sort of show you where you may want to sort of focus your efforts using other sources of information in a qualitative way, for example, through narratives or through other sources of patient feedback, be they walkthroughs or focus groups or um, patient and family advisory councils or involving patients as partners in co-design. All of these methods come together to basically identify possible strategies for improvement. So the fourth piece of this cycle is to then employ those strategies, carry them out, and then um, complete the cycle by monitoring your performance. How well did you do? And then the cycle begins to repeat and you go through this sort of on a continuous basis. So the next slide shows you one important resource um, that we've made available for um, a number of years. Uh, again, this is part of the CAPS sort of inventory of tools. Um, this is available on the CAPS site. It's free for use, uh, as all of our resources are. It's the Ambulatory Care Improvement Guide, and while it focuses primarily on health plans and medical practices, by mapping specific strategies with evidence that they work to improve things like access or care coordination or communication, there are also some overall strategies of organizational change that are covered that um, are relevant to all healthcare organizations. Uh, next slide. Another important tool, and Karen mentioned this uh, at the top of, of the webcast, is the CAPS database, which is actually a set of databases for selected CAPS surveys. Uh, currently, we support the CAPS Health Plan Survey for Medicaid and CHIP populations the home and community-based services for long-term services and supports. And as Karen mentioned, we are just in the process now of developing a new database for the Child Age Cap Survey. All of these databases are designed to provide information to users uh, for assessing their performance compared to averages or to specific sort of comparators that are relevant to them. And we also maintain um, data files for research purposes that de-identify all of the participating organizations um, and that are eligible for approved research projects. Important to mention that participation in these databases is voluntary, uh, open to all users. And because of that, we 
don't claim to be representative for all of the settings that are used uh, for these CAP surveys, but uh, we try to be as complete and comprehensive as possible. Next slide. For each one of the databases we maintain, we have uh, basically four kinds of products. Karen mentioned uh, the online reporting tool called ARC Data Tools, which is a new place for what used to be the CAPS online reporting system. And this provides um, the ability to look at different sort of displays of CAPS summary level results. Uh, you can print and download uh, information into reports for, that are customized for your use. Um, a second product is what we call the chart book. It's an annual publication, which we uh, use to summarize overall results and provide information regarding analytic insights and trends, et cetera. We also have what we call private feedback reports, which for submitting organizations are basically simple Excel files that show your results case mix adjusted using the, the characteristics that Stephanie described to averages that you can compare to. And these are private for your eyes only. Um, and they're basically tools again for, for uh, quality improvement. Finally, we have research data sets that are de-identified as to organizations um, that we make available for approved research projects. Next slide. This is just a screenshot that shows you sort of what the landing page looks like for this new ARC Data Tools website. And you can see, you can choose between the Health Plan Survey Database or the Clinician Group Survey Database. You can look at top box scores or percentiles or look at bar graphs. The next slide shows you a distribution uh, of um, scores. Next slide, please, Stephanie. This is for one example question for the adult Medicaid population. It's a, an access composite, which shows the distribution of responses uh, for that question by region, for example. One final um, slide I'm going to show is just to kind of give you a sense of, next slide please, that the chart book idea that we have for each one of our databases, this is from the health plan survey in 2021 that was just released in December. And we have a lot of infographics and comparisons of, of different populations in this particular database and trend charts and percentile distributions and respondent characteristics. So I just highlight a few of these examples to illustrate kind of the range of tools that uh, we talked about at the top of the webcast that are available. Um, we continue to revise and, and, and sort of update these, these resources for you, and we welcome um, your use. And at this point, Stephanie, I'm going to turn it back to you to see the kind of questions uh, we might have to, to try to answer. Thank you, Dale. Um, and thank you all for your engagement to this point. This is where we turn it over to you to ask your questions. Uh, really interested to make sure that we can get to as many of them as possible. Um, so you will see you have a Q&A a feature within your WebEx uh, structure. It may not look exactly like what I have here on screen, but you should see the Q&A there. Um, and if you select the all panelists uh, in terms of who you're asking the question to, and just go ahead and type your question into the box that opens up. We're gonna try to get through as many of them as we possibly can here. The first question that we have queued up, Dale, is for you. Uh, does CAPS report results for disaggregated racial, ethnic, and language data to determine the impact on diverse populations? Well, that's a really good question and particularly timely given the um, growing interest in, in health equity that we see all over the country, primarily as a result of the pandemic and the disparities in, in racial and ethnic groups that, that were revealed. Um, so we can say that a number of CAPS users are, in fact, uh, doing this sort of stratification of their CAPS survey results by race and ethnicity and by language, and increasingly by other sort of um, breakouts that include you know, age and, and SOGI, um, sexual orientation and gender identification. So um, I could think of a number of examples. One is was the, the Centers for Medicaid uh, Service and Medicaid Service, CMS's Office of Minority Health. Now, it has actually for the last 10 years published an annual report that shows um, CAP scores for the Medicare Advantage plans um, by race and ethnicity. And um, that's just one example. It's a publicly available 
and uh, some of the some of the CAPS database uh, team are, are also researching racial and ethnic disparities in the Medicaid population. So there's a lot of activity, yeah, in this area. Um, and the uh, the research files that I mentioned from the CAPS database for the health plan survey and the clinician and group survey to date um, can be available for this kind of analyses uh, if you have a specific research project that you'd like to propose. Thanks, Dale. Um, I'm going to keep you on the hot seat if you don't mind. Yep. Um, another question we have here is uh, a patient's family is a valuable source of clinical information. The family can also provide feedback to the clinician regarding mistakes and or potential hazards. COVID shuts the family out. Has this impacted quality of care and morale of providers? Yeah, again, that's a really good question. Sort of motivated in the last year to two years we've been during the COVID-19 pandemic, and, and we've seen effects of the pandemic, I think, in both positive and negative ways. So, for example, initially um, at the beginning stages back in the spring of 2020, for about a quarter or two, there was a, a very notable rise, for example, in HCAPS, HCAPS hospital CAPS survey scores nationally. Um, I think because everyone was working together and there was a lot of um, understanding and empathy uh, that patients uh, had for the providers that were struggling with the with the pandemic. We've actually seen a gradual uh, decline um, since then, and they haven't. They've begun to sort of stabilize. But I think everyone, to the point of the question, is is getting just a little bit burned out, and particularly our clinicians and staff on the front lines. Um, so it's very clear that health systems are struggling. Um, and I do think, yeah, COVID has definitely impacted their ability to deliver the kind of care that they um, have, you know, in mind and, and, and desire to to deliver. Um, and so we we do see, you know, obviously significant burnout and attrition and shortages of staff, and and hopefully we'll get through this. Um, it was a really it's a really important question. I know that healthcare organizations are struggling with this, and and it and it does show up in and some of the CAP survey results. Thank you, Dale. Um, we have uh, another question. We're asking for a little bit more information about the uh, telehealth questions and note that it's very exciting. And uh, Julia Cohn, I would agree with you. I do think it's really exciting. Um, and Karen, I'll, I'll start and let you uh, pipe in there after if you like. Uh, but ARC made a very strong commitment to the need to rapidly adapt CAP surveys to ensure that experiences of patients receiving telehealth were included. Um, you know, pre-COVID, there was some telehealth uh, happening, but not in, in huge proportions the way that it all of a sudden began happening. Um, and so there was a need to really quickly pivot and develop questions and and to redevelop some of the, the language around some of the questions to ensure that it included telehealth. Um, so Karen mentioned that there were some updates to the clinician group and also the health plan survey. So those would be the 3.1 and 5.1 respectively. And those updates were intended to make sure that um, as patients were thinking about their experiences over the last six months or 12 months, whichever they were being asked about, um, that they would include their experiences that were both in person and also that may have been uh, healthcare experiences delivered through telehealth. And so those adaptations were made to those existing surveys to make sure that the CAP survey was still capturing that continuum of care that was occurring. Um, and Karen, I'll turn it over to you. Do you want to say a few words about the uh, clinician group CAPS, the visit beta survey? Oh, I think you might still be on mute. Sorry about that. Uh, thanks for the question and thanks for the comment about being this being excited, exciting. We we agree. It is very exciting, and I'm I'm so happy to see that others feel the same way. Uh, Stephanie summed up the uh, the survey. I want to and and what our mission was, and it was in response to the pandemic uh, and the rise in telehealth. Uh, we spent a lot of time thinking about how to position this survey, whether it was going to be an independent survey or a supplemental item. And, and uh, we got through the cognitive testing 
of this survey. It's a visit based survey on your last visit. You know, how, what was your experience with, with additional questions for an audio or a, a video visit? The, this is not yet a CAPS trademark survey, meaning it hasn't been uh, through the pilot test process. It's only been through testing with, um, with potential respondents, but it hasn't received the full field test. We hope to do that. We hope to have the opportunity to field test that. And if you're, this is, uh, if you're at all interested in working with us or finding out more or participating in a pilot test, drop us a line at one of the uh, email addresses we'll, we'll give you at the end and just let us know of your interest. Uh, we're always happy to, to know of people's interests and find opportunities to work with them. So thanks again for the question. Thanks, Karen. Um, and Dale, I'm going to pivot back to you and to uh, the databases and data access. There are actually two questions that came in that I think I can uh, put together uh, and lob your way. So one is, where can you download individual provider CAP scores on the ARC website? Okay. Um, and the other one is about uh, getting access to narrative data or the qualitative data that can be included as supplemental items for uh, CAP surveys? Well, okay. So first of all, we do not have provider specific data that can be downloaded that identifies any individual provider. The data that have been submitted that we maintain at the CAPS database um, are either at the plan level or at the group level or at the practice level. Um, there, um, there's very little information related to CAPS performance at the individual provider level at all. Now, you know, CMS uh, maintains, I mentioned their compare site, and there's a doctors and hospitals section of the compare site, which you can identify individual clinicians and you can um, select a clinician in your, in your zip code area. Um, and the zip, the, 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 the information on that website will tell you uh, whether there are performance data available for that clinician. And if there are, you can access it, but it goes back up to the group level in which that provider is located. So that's the provider level information answer. The narrative data, this is very exciting. I'm working with a team that has been you know, sort of pioneering the development of narrative item sets. As you mentioned, Stephanie, in your remarks, that's a supplemental item set for um, the clinician group survey. We're working on a health plan item set as well as one for the child age cap survey. That information is collected by the participating organizations. And so it's their uh, information. We do not intake and maintain the narrative sort of verbatim responses within the CAPS database. It's just something that would be almost impossible for us to classify and maintain in any sort of meaningful way. So I hope that answers the question. Thank you, Dale. Um, there's a question about, uh, there's four different types of CAP surveys. And so for um, anybody reflecting back on the slides, there were those four quadrants that I talked about. Um, and a question about, does that mean that an individual might receive multiple surveys uh, looking at kind of different aspects of their care, uh, for example, from a provider and a health plan at the same time? Um, and the answer is, we really hope not. Uh, and there is a lot of coordination that occurs. So uh, one of the major users of CAP surveys uh, is CMS. And for example, CMS is very careful in how they draw their sample to ensure wherever possible that the samples that they require to be fielded for, uh, for their purposes, that they don't have overlapping members. And so wherever possible, there is coordination you know, across different uh, entities to try to ensure that there is no extra burden on, on a patient to, for example, respond to multiple surveys about the same encounter or the same series of encounters. Um, is it possible that it could happen? Uh, yeah, it, it is, unfortunately. Um, that said, there really is um, a strong effort to try to ensure that there's coordination across all users. Uh, everybody wants to ensure that burden on any one uh, patient is um, it is not overwhelming. Um, there is uh, another question about uh, reading level or reading ability for the surveys. Um, 
and and I would say that's something that uh, within the CAPS team we're very conscious of. And so as part of the development and testing of CAPS surveys, there is a process by which we do assess that. Um, and so we have um, plain language and um, literacy uh, members within our team who help to assess some of that. Um, and you know, while we don't have kind of one grade level that we can report across all surveys, we do try to ensure that wherever possible, we can simplify the language, we can reduce the total number of words and syllables and so on. Um, we have found that the more complex the, uh, the concept is, the higher the reading level becomes. And so, for example, for the core surveys, we have been fairly successful at trying to maintain those at a fairly low reading grade level. Um, and for some of the supplemental items where you get into concepts like shared decision making, um, some of those are at a higher grade level um, and we continue to uh, elicit input from users and stakeholders if there are other ways that um, we can try to reduce the burden. Um, but that's certainly something that is at the forefront of our mind whenever we are developing a survey and when we are testing them uh, both with our uh, language experts and with consumers themselves directly. So thank you for that question. Um, uh, Karen, I think this one uh, is in your wheelhouse and I think you may have mentioned it, um, but wondering <clears throat> if the CAPS products are available free of charge just to um, ARC uh, contractors and employees or if they are available to the whole uh, wide stakeholder universe. Oh, Karen, I think you're on mute. Keep doing that. Uh, thanks for the question. Uh, all of the products on the ARC website are available uh, free of charge, and you can go ahead and download them and use them. Uh, and if you're, I, I do wanna say though, if you are uh, using them in another country or wish to translate them in another language and you're in another country, you'll need to just drop us a note uh, to ask for permission to use them internationally, but there still is no charge. So just look at our technical assistance, you write to our technical assistance um, uh, email address, you'll see at the end, and we uh, will forward it to the right place. I just also wanted to add one thing to the question, one, one point to the question about the telehealth surveys. We did uh, do a webcast on this. You can look for it on, it was December 12th, 2020. So if you want to find out more, uh, just consult that website and the, that web page and the slides and listen to the to the webcast. Thanks. Karen, um, and there's I'll just tag on to that. <clears throat> Since you mentioned the, uh, the support available through the CAPS user network, uh, Victoria Lindstrom has asked if if she has specific questions about a survey or a survey administration, is there support for that? And yes, absolutely. Um, in the very upcoming slides, as we wrap up our webcast here, we will give you the um, the specific telephone number and email address for that. Uh, but yes, or you can seek them out from the uh, ARC CAPS website, but please do go ahead and reach out to us if you've got either overarching questions or if you've got specific questions about a particular survey administration, uh, we do have a team available and at the ready to help you. Um, there are a couple of questions that we're gonna try and squeeze in on a survey administration. Uh, Chad has asked about um, best practices for increasing male survey response rates um, and, and increasing response rates across male or any mode is something certainly that we continue to look at. Um, and, and what I would say about each of those is that it's very specific to your patient population. So for example, um, if your provider group is Kind of a well-known entity and has a logo or a brand or something that is distinctive that you think would be recognizable to your patient population, make sure it's on the envelope so that they know that it's coming from you so they choose to open that envelope. Um, likewise, with the survey cover letter, uh, people don't like too much information in there. Keep it succinct and be really clear about what it is that you're asking and why is that important. There are some examples in the CAPS documentation, but certainly 
it really should be customized to your patient population. It should be signed from someone who, you know, has a meaningful relationship with that patient that you're hoping will respond wherever possible. Um, and then giving people an opportunity to, uh, to complete at various times. So if I've misplaced the first survey, if you send me another one, and if you send me a reminder, um, I'm more likely to respond. That's what we've seen kind of over the course of time. Uh, and certainly other modes uh, paired in together with a single mode uh, have been found to be very effective as well. Um, there was another question about in office administration. And um, so, again, back to Karen's point, ARC doesn't uh, indicate specifically how any survey can or cannot be administered. However, um, what we have seen is that. The sampling that anybody may do in office in terms of it should be provided to every 10th patient or every, you know, whatever number um, often doesn't come out to be exactly unbiased. Um, the level of effort required for that in terms of uh, the staff, uh, the staff time required for that and working that into kind of uh, an operational flow. Um, so what we have found is that that can provide a lot of challenges, both in terms of the methodological rigor and also in terms of the workflow. Um, so you will see that it is not a recommended mode that uh, ARC puts forward in the guidance that is provided after you know some rounds of testing. Karen Dale, I didn't know if you had other thoughts or, or pieces that you wanted to add on with regard to modes. No, I think you did a great job with that. Yeah, great job, Stephanie. I have nothing further. Um, okay, I think we are um, almost at time here. Um, there are a couple of additional questions in terms of when are surveys conducted and collected? And I would say, again, um, because ARC doesn't require the collection of surveys on any particular cycle, they can be um, conducted at any time that makes sense for your organization. That said, Dale, I don't know if you have any uh, database timeline uh, rattle off the top of your head. Um, in general, we uh, open a submission system for the CAPS Health Plan Survey for Medicaid and CHIP programs in June, and it runs into uh, the middle of July for the HCBS survey database. That's kind of in transition now, and I think we're looking at an August submission period for 2022. And the Child Age CAPS Survey, which we're just putting together now, we're very excited about. Um, we're shooting for an, uh, late April, early May um, opening for the submission system for that survey. Okay. Um, I'm going to squeeze in one final question here um, to Rachel, who's been very patient and posed this question a little while back about the ECHO survey. So um, there is a CAPS survey that is uh, that looks at behavioral health care, and it was developed some time ago and has been uh, under redevelopment now. So we're uh, in the process of looking at field testing data and ensuring that the revised version is working as intended. So uh, looking forward to getting something out in 2022 um, after all of the testing has been finished. That said, um, I would let you know that there are some uh, behavioral health care items, supplemental items that have been released and are available through the CAPS supplemental items on the website. Um, so I would uh, encourage you to take a look at those and see if any of those help meet your needs in the interim. So seeing that we are a minute before the top of the hour, I'm going to quickly wrap up here and encourage anyone who doesn't already get CAPS updates to please go ahead um, and look for the opportunity to sign up for those updates that's on the CAPS website. Uh, and for those of you who, if you didn't get your question answered or have follow-up questions, please reach out to us. We'd be more than happy to make sure that we answer each and every one of your questions. So you may reach us by email at caps1 at westat.com, by phone at 1-800-492-9261. Uh, and again, visit our website at www.arc.gov slash caps. And with that, I thank you very much for your engagement today. We encourage you to give us some feedback about what we can do on future webcasts and how this experience was for you. Thank you so much and have a wonderful afternoon.